So I already shared that uh, number with you. And there you have the possibility to, to ask questions, you know that. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello, everybody. So we have a few more people. We are waiting until it's six o'clock, but this is just uh, two more minutes to go. Cool. Nice to see you, Martin. Okay, everybody, it's uh, six o'clock in the evening in, in Vienna, in Austria. Um, I'm uh, looking forward to a, a very interesting guest and program we uh, have today. Um, Adam, welcome. So the guy in front of the cool Breaking Bad background, here you are. <laughs> um, not yet in Vienna, but but almost. It's really cool that we can do such things. Uh, are you actually in? Uh, where are you? Are you in Vancouver? Or? I, I am on the other side of the world. Yes, Pacific, uh, the Pacific Ocean coast of North America and Vancouver, <laughs> many time zones away. So it's uh, so it's, it's your uh, evening, but it's my morning. <laughs> it's your morning. So it's it's yes. actually I guess it's actually around nine o'clock uh, for you. Yes, so. that's correct. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Okay, but then it's uh, at least kind of working. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, it works. Can... It works quite well. I'm quite yeah. happy with this. And uh, exactly, you know, this is the yeah. silver lining to COVID: is that many parts of the world can be joined together without getting on a plane. So <laughs> that's <laughs> true. That's that's kind of the upside. So let's yeah. look at, at the upside. Always positive. Here. Yes. 
Um, as you uh, may know, or some of you may know, we are actually doing a joint meetup um, together um, today. Um, sometimes uh, we, so uh, our little uh, organizer group of, of seven people here who are organizing domain-driven design, uh, Vienna and um, microservices reactive and distributed systems, Vienna, um, sometimes we also do joint meetups um, when we have so special guests and when the topic is um, so very much fitting to uh, also both groups as it is the case um, uh, this time. So I just want to make you aware there is the domain driven design group because maybe you were coming from the reactive group. Uh, and there's also the uh, reactive uh, Vienna group because maybe you are coming from the from the domain driven design group, so you should definitely also be a member of the reactive group, of course. And there's not always everything um, done jointly. Um, now, uh, before we dive into our topic of uh, event modeling, I'm just opening uh, eventmodeling.org um, for you also to make you um, already aware of that. I also want to quickly make you aware of that we um, also have a YouTube channel by now, a small one. Yeah. So we have uh, already 29 subscribers on the new YouTube channel. So if you just <laughs> go there and eventually uh, subscribe, then you can also, um, uh, for all the future, uh, watch our cool events via YouTube. Um, so this was that. And then um, we even um, have a sponsor again, um, which is uh, very cool, um, viable. And I want to um, welcome Thomas uh, Kolberbeck, um, who would um, like um, to share a few things uh, with us. It's very cool that we uh, again have a sponsor, even though we wouldn't need one. <laughs> it's great, so I can negotiate the invoice. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Thomas, maybe you want to share um, uh, also your screen with us and share a few slides with us. And mm -hmm. then uh, in about uh, three minutes or so, it's uh, mm -hmm. all your turn. Um, I'll, uh, I'll try to be done in two. <laughs> okay. But I think you have to allow me to share my screen. Okay, I have to allow that. Or at least stop sharing yours. That's possible. So maybe now it's working yes. for you already. Okay. So you should see my screen now, I guess. Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, just a second. Okay, thank you for having me and thank you, Martin, for letting me sponsor uh, again, um, uh, a meetup. I did so with my previous company, GreenTube, and I think I spoke in April at a meetup, uh, also with Andreas and Gottfried. So I'm glad to be back. Uh, today I'm representing uh, Viable, uh, the company I joined recently. I come from the gaming. Um, uh, I come from a gaming background. I spent 20 years at GreenTube, uh, building it up from seven to 700 people uh, in the gaming and gambling space. Uh, and I'm an active business angel since 2012. And since the beginning of this year, I joined Viable as a partner, uh, mainly because it's a ma an amazing group of people, and I wanted to do something on my own again. Yeah. So you will see in a moment. It's a small company. What we do here, and this is what I like, is we combine C-level management consulting. So what typically is done by McKinsey and other big fours, uh, but then I've seen those projects fail or at least fizzle away. And we actually then, and this is my role in Viable, uh, make projects out of it and persist whatever we have consulted in actual code in products so that it can live on. Uh, and the tools afterwards presented by Adam, I think would be a huge, huge help to us too. So I also enjoy, also looking forward to the talk. And uh, with that, I just briefly show you what we do. Yeah, these are some colorful boxes. Uh, they all boil down, boil down into first, we consult C-level management. So we do it top down always. Uh, then depending on what we've learned from the company, we actually suggest new ideas, new processes, which are then greenfield developments which usually is a nice thing because we get to develop something new, something on top. And then if it works out later, connect it to the boring parts or to the more challenging parts of the applications, core banking systems, um, existing systems, uh, but still keep a modern layer on top. What you see below has nothing to do with event modeling, although it looks familiar to what I've seen on the, on the event uh, modeling homepage. It's what we develop as a customer journey. And we try to elevate this journey to a point where the customer is happy across the whole journey, which is ultimately what we strive for and what we measure. 
Um, so this is how we work. We at the moment work with Angular, React, Java, and uh, AWS. But naturally, as we are at time in the, the project-based company, uh, the customer has a say in this, but we get to at least recommend it. Uh, we are a small core team based in Vienna, so we are not that far away for those joining in Vienna. Our background comes from uh, gaming, consulting, you probably know these names, uh, and product development, um, which is very nice. So I get to learn from all these colleagues. I'm a very technical person myself, so you will see that the slides I prepared are not the best. Uh, and naturally, we don't do this for the fun of it, although we enjoy it, but we are hiring, so I don't try to replace myself. But if you're looking for a nice team uh, in Vienna, we also hire remotely that pays above market uh, for above market people. So if you um, exceed our expectations, we are not shy to pay accordingly, which I think is something that many companies miss nowadays. And yeah, with that, I leave it to Adam and thank you for your attention. I hope it was short enough, Martin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. I um, relinquish the screen again. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. think you're good. <laughs> yeah, so this brings us uh, really to Adam. It's uh, totally your show now. I guess you will want to present a few things first and then maybe we can yeah. uh, also do something a bit a bit hands-on or you ha have yeah. some, some interactive part too. So I'm really looking hmm. forward to that and... Uh, it's uh, yeah. There's going to be a, there's going to be a homework assignment too. So oh, <laughs> exciting! Yeah, <laughs> you have to, to do it while you are. You will have your working. We'll day. do some. We'll do something here, of course. But uh, you know, anything worthwhile takes a little bit extra study. So I'm hoping that uh, you will have um, a bit of homework that you enjoy, and it'll um, help you think about things a little bit. And um, in a realistic scenario for what happens and in your companies and uh, how you can apply this uh, by actually uh, doing something that's a little bit less trivial. Um, but of course, it's uh, not within the scope of a, of a talk. Um, so while it's nice to get a five minute, 10 minute, half an hour exercise, it's uh, nice to have something slightly larger to really exercise uh, concept for yourself and uh, find out. So we'll have we'll have that near the end. Um, and of course, I do I do enjoy more interactive uh, sessions. Uh, and so We'll, we will have some Q&A um, at the end. I always uh, like the interactive part and um, I don't want it to be dry, just me talking at you. I like the, some feedback. I know it's not uh, the typical thing in Europe, but it's um, more typical in North America to have more interactive uh, things. I was actually quite, the first time I presented in Europe was NDC Oslo in 2012. And, okay. uh, and I, that was a shock to me because I <laughs> never saw such a quiet audience. And I thought, what's wrong with my talk? And do I have something on my face? Did I? <laughs> I was expecting all red marks in my talk. That yeah, I can talk. just say uh, Vienna is a little <laughs> bit more in the south than uh, Oslo <laughs> is. So I guess uh, everything will work out. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so that was fun. So thank you very much for attending. Um, I hope you find uh, something to take back and uh, help you in your uh, projects, whether at home or at work. And uh, so let's get started. I'll, I'll start sharing my slide deck if I can find my window now, because we've been flipping back and forth as we got ready. <laughs> I was ready before, and now we uh, went back here. So hopefully this will work. I'll start presenting. And then I will share my screen. And here we go. Okay, so everyone can see that, I hope. Mm, yes. No? Oh, good. Uh, see, there's that feedback I need. <laughs> Thank I'm North you. American, so I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll know when to talk. All right. <laughs> Great. So, um, so here, here is event modeling uh, as I presented kind of in a new format for, for a course in one of the universities here about software design. So it was a nice experiment to see how uh, in a computer science environment for engineering, uh, engineering actual solutions, trying to look at it more scientifically, how, uh, how event modeling helped tie some concepts like uh, UML and others uh, in for the students about how they're going to go out in the real world and apply uh, software design 
uh, in uh, you know after they graduate. So it was it was very nice, and it uh, I think it tied a nice bow um, at the end of the whole um, course to for them to kind of relate um, state management and all the things that you see um, in actual solutions past the scientific look at algorithms and other things. So um, let's start then. So event modeling, um, first of all, is something that I did not intend on making. Um, I was actually, uh, I thought I was practicing event storming uh, in Vancouver. Uh, and because we're so far away, removed from Europe, uh, things like on the Galapagos Islands evolve differently. Uh, <laughs> different creatures with uh, different attributes all of a sudden start to uh, come up. And so in 2018, when uh, Alberto had his uh, event storming summit, I thought, well, this is crazy what you guys are doing. You're missing a few things, uh, you know, telling this to the guy that invented event storming. Crazy, right? <laughs> this is, you know, this has worked really well for us. We love event storming. We do event storming with everyone and it works so, so well. Um, what are you talking about here? Maybe I should read your book again. Um, so, um, yeah, there was some, f uh, finite things that, that were added in Vancouver and it really goes back to, uh, just how we thought about systems when, uh, I first met, uh, Greg Young, who did event sourcing, uh, quite, quite a bit from 2005, 2006. Also, I think he came at that problem. I'm not going to speak for himself for, for him much, but, uh, he also came at the whole problem that. Uh, he really wasn't doing anything exciting. He was working in some domains that required uh, really good record keeping. And so event sourcing was a natural progression for, for that. He was in the law enforcement and gaming. So the ability to have immutable storage of history was key. But um, like many others, when you discover some application, you start to you know be happy with it and you start to apply it to other areas. And so uh, when I learned event sourcing from him. Uh, as a side effect, I learned a lot about an alternate way of specifying software. So the specifications with given when dens, et cetera, the storyline of what happens in a system was very effective. I got addicted, right? I mean, before I was already doing given when then for my unit tests and things like this, uh, but this took it to a new level. It really, uh, explained uh, the, the abstraction levels much better so that you wouldn't have to align the planets to set something up in a test, whether it was integration or unit. Uh, it, it really started to click. Um, the thing that uh, Greg was doing was putting sticky notes on a whiteboard back in 2008 <laughs> at a trading company and putting them in a sequence. So, sound familiar? Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> this stuff has naturally uh, progress just like CKRS and other concepts uh, have kind of progressed in different, you know, Martin Kleppman talks about CRDTs and does a lot of database. If you have his database book, you, you can see that these islands of innovation kind of started to pop up in different parts of the world. So uh, that's a little bit of the background of how I managed to come up with event modeling. I was really searching for a good name for it. And this came to to mind and I said, ah, whatever, I'll stick with it. I'll have the North American spelling of modeling with one L, makes a nicer diagram. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's about it. I never set out to do this, but uh, it certainly opened up an incredible journey uh, of discovery and new possibilities by changing some of the rules for myself, making some of these things a little bit more strict. Um, but in doing so, ended up having some more measurable uh, metrics for how we de uh, decompose a solution, which really helped us as a company. I, I run my own company since 2015, um, Adaptech, which uh, basically only does event sourced CKRS systems and uh, event modeling for, for specifications. And so it's nice to have a success story behind the approach that, you know, we don't, uh, you know, I'm not just here preaching at you uh, about something that I like. It's something that's use day to day to actually be better as a consulting company to make more effective systems and to be more accountable for what you're charging your clients etc so it's been it's been quite good for me to use what i thought was a good discovery in my own uh in my own company and my own job in my day to day so let's uh, get going as to what are some of those insights that i got 
Well, <clears throat> one of the first insights is actually stealing from behavior-driven development and uh, specification by example. And it's a, it's a glimpse into the human mind, basically by saying that, and I have this argument quite a lot online because, well, your specifications aren't thorough. They're not like a finite state machine where you show every single possibility. But business owners rarely know all the possibilities themselves. So when the specifications are made, why are they exhaustive? Does that seem fair? I don't think so. The boss doesn't know what he wants yet, gives you the work to have every single possibility accounted for. That doesn't seem right. Well, going back to how humanity started and civilization went back it, it, all this time and how we evolved past, spe past other species, it's about moving knowledge forward from one generation to another. And there is a core part of the human mind where we need to basically retain information from previous generations, pass them on to the next ones. And um, that's an amazing thing that human minds do is fill in the blanks. We don't actually store everything ever, right? And this goes back to why does a specification need to store every single permutation, unless it's like absolutely needed and you have some scientific or integral security thing. But for most things of like insurance companies and, and banking, you have a few permutations there. Maybe you have an inventory system or a point of sale system. Uh, it's, you know, what was it on pen and paper? Did people make mistakes when they filled out those forms? Sure, they did. It was compensating actions for taking care of that. But they did have one thing. They kept track of what happened. And we'll go back in civilizations and we see that there's tablets and there's stories and there's all these things that allow a human mind to fill in the blank. And um, there's a couple of exercises that we can do to show how the mind fills in blanks for you. So if you have kids recently um, or have relatives that have kids and you had to read them a bedtime story, did you have to go and reference Hansel and Gretel or any of these other fairy tales? No, you somehow remembered them most people did anyway, if you had good parents, <laughs> you remembered them from your own childhood and you knew a couple of key frames in that story so that you could recite that story really without a book to your kids. That's an amazing thing that makes us human is this ability to recollect so much. It's almost like fractals, you know, you have a few key points and then there's some kind of algorithm that evolves that one reference point, right? In Minecraft, you have you know, a seed. And from that seed, you generate a whole world based on an algorithm. Um, so there's a lot of these interesting things that require fill in the blank for, for retention. And uh, our brains are really slow. And so we, we can't process, you know, 30 frames, 60 frames per second recollection of every pixel that we see. We're not computers. There's an entirely different mechanism here. So let's go back and make computers more, um, uh, computer systems, uh, specifications and things like that, more human. That's the number one thing that I, um, that I, that I found. And of course, I went over this already in terms of ledgers that kind of started as a trading. I think it's from the, uh, this is from the Hudson Bay, North American trading, fur trading. These are all ledgers. So a lot of business and systems are built on ledgers. And this is, that's again, going back to civilization and systems that we had long before computers were really ledger like anyway, and they had a storyline on them. There was dates on each page of what happened when you could really walk through that and understand what happened. So that's another uh, aspect that, that I, that I learned. Um, and of course, the reason we couldn't do that with automated information systems or digitization and the advent of the processor is the idea that we could store just as much. And honestly, before the 50s, probably, um, you know, before the 60s and 50s, uh, we, we did have uh, an ability to do that because our, our, our processors were, you know, vacuum tubes. We had very slow processors comparatively. So the storage problem wasn't as big. We couldn't really even have automation, digitization to be as fast that we would fill up whatever storage we had. Now, some of that might have been, you know, not magnetic tape yet. It might have been uh, punch cards um, or whatever. But when the transistor started uh, to appear, that innovation started really the integrated circuits, the small 
uh, small size of these circuits, the low power consumption, the speed just went through the roof. It was an order of magnitude. I think there's still conspiracy theories that aliens dropped in uh, <laughs> transistors on Earth. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, what couldn't, what didn't, uh, you know, what, what didn't get the benefit of a transistor? Well, storage didn't. The magnetic media was still the same. And so, you know, these, we're looking at a picture here of an, of a, uh, of an IBM hard drive in 1956. And I forget the exact, um, you know, costs and all that, but they're, they're pretty ridiculous. Um, they were, uh, you know, the, the, the costs were absolutely, uh, crazy. Um, you know, and the, you know, these are not inflation adjusted. Um, that, that thing did cost a million dollars back in, in those days. And, uh, and it did cost that much to run, uh, this room size, small room, closet sized hard drive, uh, you know, 30,000 bucks a, a month. So while the transistor gained so much, uh, speed, uh, the, the other side of Moore's law is, uh, storage didn't. So what happened to ledgers? Well, we couldn't have ledgers because it didn't make sense to, it was, it was impractical. There was no economy of scale on the storage side. So, we really had this first idea of the screens on any terminals really reflected a state of what is now and any ledger like storage was relegated to uh, backups or, or log printouts for, for historic uh, reasons, uh, uh, for historic purposes. So that's interesting because if you think about that, it's a split between OLTP and OLAP that what was used before as online transaction processing. In other words, someone that was doing things with pen and paper always had the ledger book next to them. They could always double check whether something was okay. On a digitized system that became next to impossible because you needed to leave your computer, go and find some physical printouts to check things. There's no way that that was uh, going to be digitized. So a huge aspect of information system automation ended up being thrown away. Now, this might sound like it's more of an argument for event sourcing than um, anything to do with event modeling, but it has the same background. Um, and we have to see that because we were forced to think of systems in a different way, it forced our specifications to become different, which is something that you can start to really reflect on, especially if, if you've been in the industry around for a, you know, a few decades or a couple of decades um, or a significant amount of time, you can see how, how these forces shape how, how we automate things. And um, another, uh, another insight that I had is that, well, everything in the world is CQRS and event sourcing. I really don't care that you have an MVC application written in Ruby on Rails that shows you know, the state of a table entry with an ORM in between. The fact is what happened in people's heads when they were using it is that they had a bunch of events. What do you remember when you're, you know, using a system? Um, I think there was a German presenter, I forget his name, that made a really good point. And um, he said, you know, what happens in the real world when you change your name? You know, someone gets, someone gets married and they change their last name. Well, you remember that person not as just their new last name. You remember when you see them that their maiden name was whatever it was. You have a recollection of some history. In digitized systems, we have this way of forcing ourselves to forget what things were as if that's a good thing. We have to remember there's a reason we do that. And so the fact that um, we store things a certain way in, in modern sort of your run, you know, run of the mill applications these days is it doesn't erase the fact that the system had events that happened. I registered for this website. I added this to my shopping cart. I paid for my order. I acknowledged the receipt of the goods when it got delivered. Um, those are events on a timeline. The system may store artifacts of that. It may not even have a concept of an event internally. And uh, it basically equates to th you know, throwing away the event. So they're there. Obviously we understand that on a timeline, something happened and we had some information added to the system at each point, but we don't 
store it that way. Um, the and that that's interesting because those facts, if you can look at even a, a canonical model of of you know of, of some tables, you don't have multiple models or anything like that. Um, parts of them make different models. You can say that a, a query that joins two you know different sets of tables is a different model. Um, ideally, you don't have that, but that uh, the, the point is is that sequence of what actually happened, you take that as the truth and then project many different aspects. In traditional applications, that may be a cobbled mess of in an ERD diagram. Sure, absolutely. But it still is a projection. We try to make one projection instead of many, which is probably better. Um, so, well, no, the many is better. <laughs> Let me rephrase my grammar here. Uh, so it's, it's, but what we have, obviously from, from the past is these normalize all data. We don't have much storage, optimize things for performance right, right away. You can see where that, uh, you know, that history lesson of how we started digitizing systems shaped what tooling we have. And that's really important to, um, to understand because that will explain a lot of the resistance you get as you start to move to event-driven, reactive, domain-driven design, uh, uh, you know, goals in your organization you find some people are yeah they get it and maybe they're junior people and they don't know, they don't know anything else and they don't have some previous lessons and and habits um, but maybe some people that have 10 years of you know history they they rely on that experience it's not going to be really easy to convince them to change the way that they're writing systems so yeah, so again, those are the points that I was making there. And uh, back to Fred's uh, really excellent insight is that we also, uh, the other part of this slide is that we, we also focused a lot on, you know, trying to describe systems as to what our abstractions were and things like that. And I really struggled to get, you know, companies to adopt things like domain-driven design, et cetera. Um, there's, you know, millions of, patterns out there. Well, not millions, but quite a lot. Uh, a lot of them say the same thing. You have related patterns like bubble, strangler, you have observer, you have patterns that don't really apply in some languages while they apply in others. So there's this whole, you know, how do you get information into the system? There's a huge subjective opinion of doing that. It might be, you know, you have code reviews and say, oh, that's not how I would do that pattern. I'm going to reject that it ends up being very dubious and unscientific, unfortunately, even though there's great books written about it with patterns of integration and all the things we're real fans of. But in the end, when you turn the computer off, it's what's on disk that's left, right? And, and Fred had this insight a long time ago, said, you can show me all your clever tricks in code and all of those things, but the one thing that'll explain what your system does is if I look at your state, right? He had only tables, and third normal form back then, you know, he was at the whim of those expensive giant hard drives. So it was always a third normal form representation of state. Um, had his career started, you know, 50 years later, um, he probably would be an event sourcing evangelist. I mean, look at that statement. Um, that is a, a much better representation of state because it's immutable. It has all these excellent other qualities, right? About event sourcing. So um, anyway, um, to make a long story short about, about Fred, uh, that insight was, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop nitpicking at code quality. I'm gonna stop nitpicking on the way classes are written or what languages are chosen. I'm going to focus on how state progresses through time. That was another um, insight of, of this history. So in comes the event modeling language. Yeah, some people said that kind of looks like event storming, but weird, stretched out horizontally and there's some things missing. I think, Adam, I think you're doing event storming wrong. Correct, I am doing event storming wrong. Um, what, what we basically put together inadvertently, and I say we because it's always been, I've been surrounded with people that we've been, you know, we're trying to implement domain-driven design. We're trying to implement um, event storming, event sourcing and CKRS and all the really good patterns where, where they made sense. 
and uh, and that's how we made our living. So uh, what we discovered as a consultancy is that you need to not have too much baggage with you. <laughs> so there's certain things that didn't end up sticking because it was just too hard to enforce so many patterns. We had only so much time to be effective. So you'll notice if you're familiar with event storming, there is no uh, there's no hotspots. There, you know, there is no uh, there's no users. Users became front and center at the top instead of some stickies because we ended up having to work with a lot of designers and UX UI. And from the business perspective, that was incredibly important. So we noticed that a lot of what we do in domain driven design, et cetera, is is really focused on the uh, developer side. Uh, even though we try to reach out with ubiquitous language, et cetera, we're very much still in the how the system works in the patterns. We still get aggregates and all of these things from domain driven design. And that's still not as friendly to the other people that are very important in the process. So as a conscious decision, we started to include um, all of the wireframes or, or screenshots of um, of exactly what the system would look like to a person. So think of it as a storyboard for a movie. You have a couple of actors, and again, we're all using by example, all of these things. This is my canonical example of a hotel automation system that you can see in the, in the event modeling uh, web, uh, website. And, and we can audit this by saying, this is the best representation of a happy path through the system. And it should be the spinal cord, the, the thing that keeps it together because we can get the most people in an organization to agree that if the system works like that for you know 85% of our customers, we're very happy. We'll take care of some of the exceptions and the details later, that's okay. But this really forms an excellent backbone to hang everything else off of. Um, we will again interrogate whether we've made the right decisions in some places as we dig into it. But for a first pass, this is excellent. And basically, the I started to look at this. It's really replacing UML because UML doesn't do a good job for the UI and all the other roles. Right? We can start to plan, project plan, and and look look at how long systems will do. We can introduce uh, estimates back into software. Really interesting concepts. So. Um, recently, I started to refer to event modeling as a language more than anything else because its primary purpose is communication. And um, as you can see, there's only four pieces um, in, in this that you see. There's the upper part, which has either you know, screens or some automation processors, maybe cron jobs, whatever may, might be running behind the scenes, we re represent that. You'll notice there's a timeline and you'll notice there's no branching. And that's very important because it goes back to the first part that I talked about. Branching adds complexity. It gets rid of our brain's ability to recall a lot. The minute you up the cognitive load and have to remember a tree structure rather than a linear set of events, that's when you lose your natural human ability to recall. And recollection is a huge part of communication. Uh, if you don't have to refer to a diagram because you recall more, that's time saved. That's one less meeting. That's one less whatever, um, one less context switch. So th that's really important for, for that. And that's why you won't see um, uh, any branching. So of course that uh, cleaning schedule, you know, that room ready part might fail. Of course it can. That's systems. There will be failure. There, there will be choices. But we actively say we're not going to go down those roads so that we can get the complete story first. And uh, that's quite important. It's a, quite a unifying uh, aspect of this that brings people to, onto the same page. So, you know, the swim lanes divide up the subsystem the underneath, right? We talked about, uh, we talked about uh, how this applies to domain-driven design, et cetera. So uh, the swim lanes really are what defines your bounded contexts and other concepts. Subs if you're not doing DDD, you could refer to these as subsystems, depending on you know what language you use or you know hexagonal ports and adapters, all that kind of stuff. You can organize it still uh, down below. Um, I like to bring in external sources of information here. So you can really say which of these lines is a system boundary. So it, it goes with systems thinking. 
uh, allowing you to draw a, a box around what you're in control of and where the inputs outputs are from your system. Um, so that, that's quite interesting. Swim lanes also will look later um, during the presentation as to, you can, you can further divide them up for your entities, or if you will, if you're still using you know, DDD terms for that, you can say aggregates and, and points of transactional integrity, or at least something that shares a common key. You can start to subdivide those things to say that I have five orders uh, currently in the system, here are the uh, here are the things that have happened to each of those on a timeline, by example. And of course, the user um, interaction we definitely show, and that depends on the type of project. Sometimes you might come at a project from the business perspective, uh, and the, and and the client says, "Look, we need this app and this backend system to make to make everything work." Uh, so where do we start? They don't, sometimes don't even know where to start. First of all, you can use this as a replacement for pro problem space discovery. I like to do problem space discovery by example. So I say, well, let's throw these screens together like this. Is that something that you see your customers using and being happy with, right? Of course, everything will be experimented with. Once we get an MVP, we'll get feedback. This is not very rigid. You can still use this as an idea exchange. Like in event storming, we really kind of move freely with stickies about what events happened. Same thing, but we throw in the, um, the visual part. And there's another reason why the visual part is here. Even if our system is entirely back end, I would put screens that show progress on like a monitoring screen. Maybe it's a progress bar that someone sees and maybe there's a little drop down with the, you know, the details view. Like when you're updating your software, you can see what lines are being executed. Um, it might be, you know, a a general aggregator of how many orders have been processed uh, today or something like that. But we always give a visual. And the reason we always give a visual even for backend systems is because of a significant percentage, let's just call it arbitrarily half of the population are visual learners. They appreciate sticky notes with writing on them, but it doesn't register the same way that, that someone that, that is analytical. So we have to be inclusive, right? Inclusivity is the number one goal of um, uh, of, uh, of event modeling because that helps the community communication, right? So if this is useless to someone from design, then we failed, right? So that's why it's called the event modeling language so that we can communicate within as many, with as many roles as possible and really treat this as a blueprint. That's another word that I use a lot is that we are missing blueprints in software and, uh, we have some for the technical side, but we don't have something for the organization. And we still want to have a blueprint like other engineering disciplines, right? We want to be better engineers. I think everyone wants to do that. So why do we not have blueprints? Well, you know, UML is too long to, you know, might as well be writing the code if you're going to be drawing every a box for every class you make. True. That's why we don't have classes here, right? This is why we support, you know, force uh, just state view because it's enough. So that's, uh, that's how we show examples of what happens over a time. Now, the middle is kind of interesting. It's an optional one. If you're starting out really quickly, I usually leave, leave this out um, and fill it in later. And this identifies the input and the output of the system across a timeline. And it identifies data going in, data going out. You'll notice that it's going to be more uh, useful in in other applications such as security, which is coming up on another slide, and other, other concepts such as SLAs and uh, some other requirements that you can elaborate on. But it's also nice to see the patterns. So this, this entire, you know, this entire uh, set of swim lanes really looks like music notes. And so people have called this the harmony of your system, because as you're looking at it, you see um, patterns, just like you look at a sheet of music, you know, that piece of, of that particular, um, uh, you know, uh, music is going to sound like something. And so people now look at event models from far away and see that, oh yeah, that's the thing we're working on. And this part I can see in the pattern is payment heavy and that's probably the checkout part. And you start to really develop this, the book or the blueprint of your application to really look like these, these music notes. And these, so just to clarify, uh, the blue is, are the commands 
and they basically are intents to change the system. I don't like to use the word input because it implies that something's going to immediately give you output. Or if you need to look at something, it, it kind of says that, hey, I need to poke the system to get some information out. And that's, that's not the way things really work. Um, we only want to capture things that change state, not um, not say that commands are interactions with the system. So a lot of times if you've done, for example, event storming with, with, with brand new people, they might start to say, well, my event is I queried for the total sales, right? Or I queried for, um, you know, the last price or the last order. Those are, those are not changing states. So they're not commands, but people see that as an interaction. So I try to move away from the input output mindset and say state change and you know affect, how are you gonna affect changing the system so it serves you? And then how, conversely the green, how is the system going to inform you so that you can make right decisions? What information is the system going to inform you about? And that moves away from the input output kind of mechanical way that we think of things and really starts to think about this as an organization of information. And that's it. So like I said before, we didn't have much time to teach people a lot. So what are the core things that ended up sticking around? Well, these are the four core things. We really needed these and everything else ended up being less of a priority. And that's why these made it to being the core piece. And there is a th saying that simplicity is hard to get at. And sometimes you need to do that through many, many experiments to get, get to it. And our experiments showed that these four pieces were, were the core that you needed to have to get everyone on the same page as to what's happening in the system. Adding any more was a decreasing uh, curve on your returns. Uh, you were past that. There's many reasons for that. Um, the other thing that people have trouble with is that there's only one way that things can connect. And there's a very good reason for that. And in reactive systems, we say, well, that's not true. An event can trigger a command. Yes and no. Uh, there is an implied projection of when you receive that event that you can then send a command. If it's a no op, fine, but that means it's an empty green box. And uh, oh, there's no UI or job. Was there a, is, there any, is there a system that does this automatically? Then it's a no op as well, but it's there. And having the circle of what you can command, what you can connect with allows you to draw on very few patterns that you need to enumerate to get estimates right. No matter what your implementation is, because you have a very strict way of connecting things, you have very few patterns to uh, categories of patterns. You don't have 150 enterprise patterns all of a sudden. You only have four patterns that you can get out of this, right, that we use. And so what happens when you have few patterns? You have to decompose large patterns into the smaller patterns. Seems tedious, but the benefit of that is that now you have a way to get a better unit of work. And in doing so, you get a better way to have estimates calculated from actual work instead of subjective things such as planning poker and other things. Now, there's a whole bunch of things about cadence and, and repeatability of your solution that, that come into play. Um, especially if you're doing event sourcing, et cetera. Um, but we can also take advantage of this in, uh, in traditional systems. What generally happens though, is that we start to see uh, just the horror show of coupling <laughs> in traditional systems, um, which is still okay. I mean, if you have a canonical model for your data and you want to squeeze in uh, an extra field for some process, or you want to delete a field or do other changes, if you have an event model for that traditional system, you can actually go back to business. Look, this is going to like change half of our workflow in the entire system. And it's not going to be, you know, just add me a field here, an afternoon of work. It's going to be a disruptive set of changes that's going to require four months of development and testing. So you need to have those uh, back. And so having this is, is quite important. Um, the other thing that we do in this, uh, in this model, let me just go back to it because I forgot to mention it, is that there's something quite important that, uh, that people don't realize. It's the information completeness. So not only do you get a, a space for each of the data points that you're gonna have in your system, but you also can audit whether something appeared magically in the middle of your workflow or 
something uh, wasn't needed. And uh, for some reason, that screen shouldn't even have that, that, that particular field because it's, it's not used anywhere. It's not even recorded. So that information completeness is quite important because it also supports the coupling. So seeing which parts of the system get affected by something and, uh, and, and test our assumptions. Uh, for very large systems, as they get um, non-trivial, this becomes incredibly uh, valuable. It, it literally saves projects. I'll show an example of a really large project that was saved because of this. Um, so back here we go. So now the details. So yeah, it seems simplistic, right? Have just the happy path. Our systems are, are you know, more complicated. Well, if we have data variants, we can start to do given when thens and for reads given thens. So we can set up scenarios that basically point and we can have a, we can have a little legend and generally the details are shown down below. You'd be surprised how, how few times you actually need this and how powerful the inductive you know, abilities of human minds are that you know, we rarely need to do this level of given when then. There's so much uh, that people understand from the intent of the whole system because you have that story that this need to over specify seems to go away because we're trusting people. And we're trusting them because everyone's on the same page. It's hard to trust someone if you don't think they have the same idea of the system. And that's where the silos in our industry really hurt us, right? If we have a blueprint where everyone understands how the whole system works, all of a sudden trust is elevated because you can say that, well, why did you do that? You understand the whole system must look like this at the end of the project. And I say, oh, you're right. That was a mistake. It's not my misinterpretation of what's going to happen. That's very important. Uh, um, complexity. Can, can, some, can somebody oh. interrupt for a sec? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, just a clarification question because mm -hmm. I'm looking at your presentation on a very large screen, but it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's way too small to see the example. Good because that's a trivial example. <laughs> I copy pasted some things that were uh, um, actually identical. I just wanted to show the structure. Um, so, but generally what would be in there would be at the top, uh, let me explain at least what's supposed to be in there. Um, the yellow uh, stickies, I usually interchanged for orange for events. And that's simply when we were still allowed to be in offices together. Um, I don't know about you, but um, yellow stickies are way easier to find in stores than orange ones. And uh, we seem to use events quite a lot in what we do in modern event-driven systems. So it was a conscious decision. I know Alberto already went, you know, he, he's, he's made the decision that there's way too much in event storming based on orange. So it's too late for him. But I thought before I fall in that same hole, I'm just going to grab on a branch and crawl out and, and bring in yellow stickies to mean events so that everyone can find these more easily in, in the stores and we don't have an orange sticky shortage in the world. So anyway, that's uh, those are past events and we build up a, a, a scenario. For example, if we have a, a report of, uh, let's say a report is our invoice amount and we have different taxation on different items and maybe we have a discount after you know a certain amount of purchases uh, on one invoice. 10% uh, discount if you order more than you know 100 bucks worth or something like that. We can show the progression of people adding more and more items into the basket, and we can show how that invoice changes as each event happens. That's basically what's happening in the, in the left-hand side um, example. Um, in the middle example, um, we can reuse the same scenario of the same events happening to show a couple more uh, different reports that are using the same events. Uh, so we can start to you know, do that, but it's always real data in there. So you're, you know, you're showing items of a certain price being added. And then down below in the green, you're showing how that invoice from left to right changes as each new um, event happens. Now, uh, the, you know, stacking them up is kind of repetitive. So you could actually fold those down and just show new events across the top, as long as you understand that that's just building up the scenario. So you can play around with the format but it's about being clear where clarity is needed. For example, some of those business rules that may apply to like, you know, 
we have a store, so we know what the general workflow is, but we don't want to derail the clarity of that left to right workflow by showing, you know, 50 permutations on there of different sizes of orders, but it would just be too large to read. So we can make this reference um, to specific places. Now, um, what happens when we have a major change in the workflow, let's say it's not just about whether we have a 10% discount or not. Um, that's the second largest kind of the sort of the second pattern that we have. Uh, before the first red line here is the happy path. Um, actually, sorry, before the second, um, uh, before the second, let me just get my cursor here so you can see your, can you see my cursor on the screen? Uh, is it there? I yes. don't know if Zoom shows my cursor. Okay, if it does, perfect. So, so this line here is the end of our, our happy path. This line in the middle here says, what happens when the trade goes wrong? Well, let's say we couldn't get the price we wanted and we now have to back out. We then reference this other part on the very right-hand side as to what happens with the system in that seriously unhappy path, which is not just the trivial undo or redo or retry, right? This is for major alternate workflows that affect you. That's the second pattern that we use here is we generally, um, is we generally decompose large areas like that into, um, you know, here's a reference point in the middle of the workflow where things can potentially go really wrong and it will introduce an entirely different workflow to continue from here. And that's, that's where we explain that alternate workflow is on the very right hand side. And generally there are, there are arrows pointing at the top here saying that if things go wrong, check here. And generally we also label them. They're very well known scenarios in a business. And so we really don't, um, uh, require a specific notation for it, but the, the language and the way we express state change over time is still done the same way. Now, the, the third kind of uh, least common way to do it is where there is a small alternate workflow. Let's say you put in the wrong password and you're going to retry something. We simply add that as an extra step in the workflow, like somewhere in here. So there could be like, a, I tried to type in this password, but it was my old one. So I get a, you're not logged in. And I try again with the right one and now I'm logged in. What that does is it sh still shows by example what screens people see in both scenarios. And it's not a, as big a problem to have an entire workflow for it. Um, and it's, it's something that does affect what screens you see and things like that and what the workflow is. So it's not a data thing. You can't put it in that first pattern, but that seems to work generally. So we have these three ways of getting into the details and explaining them. So. Why do we do this again? It's because we don't want to, you know, plop the domain driven design blue book on everyone's desks and ask them to learn this. Uh, you know, if everyone understands domain driven design, the whole company will be awesome. Well, great, but how, you know, in my day, in my consulting days, getting everyone to understand domain driven design was like pulling teeth. It was just, you know, people have their lives, people can't all be reading the book after hours. You can't expect business to say, everyone stop what you're doing and read the book for a month. There's a, there's a lot of information in all that. You add Vaughn's book, you add all, you know, Alberto's book, Greg's event versioning book. You add all these books and it's going to take a long time to, to get change. And, uh, and then, you know, which parts do you learn first? It, it's quite a lot. So, Generally, training, adoption, and mastery, and you know, we actually the, the sponsor was talking about this, right? How do you roll this stuff out, right? Um, <laughs> you need to be able to have a rollout plan once you've adopted something in one team and all that. That can take a long, long time if it's something non-trivial. And so, what event modeling wants to do, why it only has four pieces, why it only has four patterns, is you want to explain the gist of it in 15 minutes, and then you want to have a real exercise and a real um, a, a real application of it to learn from and it needs to be valuable immediately so if you can show uh, you know uh, wireframes you can interact and communicate with the design team if you can show SLAs if you can show where boundaries are crossed first for for security purposes to the security au auditors 
you can do that, right? So you can do quite a lot in a very short amount of time. And that's basically it. So the, the idea that you can make a lot of people learn a lot of things is really hard to do. And so event modeling was always about being minimalistic so that you have something that's easy to on the meta level communicate about. It's like, hey, can we design a system? Absolutely, we can do that at lunch. I can start drawing on a napkin of what these are the screens you're gonna see. And we're gonna do some preliminary audit as to what information we capture and what possible state changes we can have and some of the projections off that state that are gonna be key. Uh, I can do that very, very quickly uh, anywhere and uh, without really explaining this. I basically end up doing an event model without even explaining event modeling to people. I just start drawing and I say, is this, is this kind of what happens in your system? I can start from the event, the events at the bottom, or I can start with the screens at the top, whatever the conversation needs. From that, I know I haven't wasted my time. I don't have to scrap all that. That's actually valuable information. That can just keep evolving to a full event model, which is quite, which is quite useful. So why do this? Um, it's kind of anti-agile, right? Um, not anti-agile, but it gives scope to agile things. And I think having a design removes a rework because if we, if we look at, you know, let's say a typical way of dividing things up in sprint and uh, in a sprint, and most typical teams don't really do a lot of, you know, design for this, you know, the database side at least or anything like that. It's kind of, well, we'll it's all yagni to the extreme. You're not going to need it until next sprint or whatever. Don't assume that the business knows what it wants. Just continue building, and then you'll have to, you know, wedge in the next features. And this is why the refactoring ends up being this death curve. I call this the death curve for a num number of reasons because the integration stories become way more complicated. It's why a feature that's done at the beginning is easier and takes less time than the same exact same feature put in in the six months into the project. And that's because you need to do a lot of rework. You need to rejig things. You need to add the coupling to the existing solution. So what happens with, with event modeling is that you have um, a way to come up with not UML, but a solution that at least tracks state so that you're not re refactoring for the sake of introducing coupling. You take care of the coupling question at the beginning. And so you want that flat cost curve. When I add the last feature, I really don't need to be changing the SQL statements to accommodate for other you know, uh, values and other rows or anything like that for a feature that I wrote six months ago. Um, we need to have a better blueprint. Like all other industries have, you know, all other engineering disciplines have blueprints that they work off of. Um, the reason that we don't have this um, in, in software these days is because there was a horrible time in the 90s and 80s where most of the large software projects out there, enterprise software projects were done in a, uh, an aspect of engineering, at least in, in North America, where you had separate companies doing specifications than the ones that were doing the implementations. And that caused a battle for budget, which meant that waterfall was actually not represented properly. Waterfall is iterative. Is iterative. It's not big, big design upfront. Waterfall is broken down into stages if it's done properly. And I got this, you know, I got this from Mel Conway for, from his mouth. So it's not, <laughs> it's not something I'm making up. And, the, you know, his history in that, uh, in North America, in the enterprise world is a reflection of how the waterfall process was taken advantage of by two competing companies. One that was being contracted for specs one that was contracted for the implementation. When you have that competition, you start to compete for budget. And that's where the ugly waterfall came from. And that was something that needed to be fixed. And Agile came around, uh, along and fixed it, but we're still on that crutch. And so that push is to have no design, uh, unfortunately, at least not in to the same level that you have design in others. And we have all sorts of excuses about, well, we don't have, you know, when you build a bridge, you can't you know, destroy it and change the spanners easy. That's fine, but it's not, you know, let's not take it to the extreme saying that software is free. It still takes time to build things. So, um, you know, that argument about uh, software is not engineering is uh, a, a bit pushed too far, in my opinion. And so we have to come back to the middle somewhere where we have 
small design up front. We don't, we don't want big design up front, right? And this is, if we had big design up front, we would have UML and I would show you a, a square or a, a rectangle for every class in the system that I want. And this is why event modeling throws away all of that to keep the design small. Traditional systems, all that you're doing in DDD and event sourcing or reactive systems, you're going to get people that are doing things the old way. You need a way to build a bridge. So event modeling works for traditional systems. Now, Sebastian Boltz, I believe, Boltz, yeah, that's his name, uh, was really kind enough to make a shorthand for this. Um, but I want it to be explicit still here. Um, when we have a traditional system where, for example, there's a registration thing, we can show exactly on a timeline how we interact with that user record. And this is where we can get an insight into coupling. Right? and where we can get an insight into data loss. For example, the fact that the code was none for the verification um, is lost. It's just in a backup somewhere, right? Or we have maybe have a history table, but that, that number now is 654321. Um, we don't have any place for the fact that this was a, a blank or, or something else. We, we lose that history. So we show where data is deleted. And in fact, this none entry is deleted. There's no such thing as update. It's a delete and then a write. So that's that's kind of where where we start to show the deficiencies of a current state only ap approach, or at least an event model allows you to elaborate why um, that's uh, why we're losing information or, or why it's uh, impossible to implement a feature because we have these losses. And you can, I'll show you in a bit, we also have um, uh, a way to use this intermingled with event sourced uh, or event driven um, architectures and show them in the same diagram. So that, for example, a legacy code situation that only has tables like this, you have something that you inherited from, you know, years ago, that's, that's written in uh, on top of tables with an ORM. Um, you're writing something reactive new. How do they, how do they, communicate together. You can show quite easily with an event model where the handoff happens and what information goes from one system to another. It's about you know information pushing across boundaries. Um, stream processing for state, it's easy to represent you know these types of functional paradigms uh, where you can say, I'm gonna read everything functionally versus I'm going to pare down that to be each entity versus all the way down to the types of changes in an entity. You know, it starts to question the aggregates approach, right? With the functional perspective. Again, sorry about the small writing. I will explain what's going on here. Aggregate is on your right. We have an order, an address, items, delivery method, right? We have a way to decompose that because if you look at the very right-hand side, we have, you can't read them, but it says uh, add item, um, you know, complete the order and uh, you know deliver set the delivery address or something like that. Uh, so we have like four operations that you can do on this aggregate route, and, and our aggregate route is the order. The aggregate is all of this collection here. This nice little graph seems great, but do we need all that information to just complete the order, or any of those individual things? So on the left is how we decompose that. Start to look at things in a functional way, and this is where you can start to get. Uh, away from the OO um, focus of some of the implementation side of, uh, of domain-driven design where, look, why am I hydrating if I'm doing event sourcing this entire order? Or why am I fetching all of these tables from, from the database just to that? Oh, well, because aggregate says to do so, to have a check. That's okay, you can still have the check, but you don't need to grab all that information. So it's, it's about being very... Um, flexible in terms of what you can bring in to accomplish each of these uh, things that you want to do with an order individually. And you start to basically increase the performance and other aspects of your, of your system. I think it also allows you to decompose things a lot better. And you can show this in the swim lanes as to how, um, uh, how this decomposes. And uh, further to apply to DDD, um, you know, different, especially event sourced ones, you can start to show SLAs. You know, we, we start to put that onto, uh, uh, onto, onto the event model itself. Um, 
we can show cross uh, uh, cross aggregate um, invariance. So for example, what's the total amount of orders outstanding today? It can't be more than seven or whatever it is. This might be a reservation system, who, who knows? But we need to have a projection off of those previous facts to feed that into a command, et cetera. We can, we can show all those things um, uh, in that. And uh, let me see here, what else? Uh, yeah, so polyglot architecture, this is something that we can start to do when we think of a state. Um, even in non-event uh, sourced systems, we can start to put in different stacks to make something uh, work together. And the reason we can do that is because we're following open close principle. We are taking each uh, state change as something that you don't have to go and rewrite, which is one of the reasons you can't have polyglot architecture in most places is because we're doing agile with Yagni. And so if it's gonna be in a different language, I might have to go and crack open that you know, that registration thing to add the email verification functionality. That lack of open close principle is the reason it's really hard to have true polyglot. We start to look at people, we, we interpret polyglot as saying, um, our developers need to know more languages, not we're polyglot so that we can have people that like a specific language always implement in that language. You'll start to see more of that in the serverless, world where people say, you know, I just have a function here that that the cloud's going to run for me. And I really don't care what language it's written in. Uh, people start to care if you're going, someone else is going to have to maintain that code. So that maintaining the code and code reviews, these subjective things need to be thrown out if you can, because you don't want to add rework. And that small design up front removes the need for rework. And therefore, if there are problems, because you have granularity, at least if there is rework, you're changing the type of state transition. So what you want the granularity to enable you to do is to be able to throw away and rewrite a piece. And with event modeling, that becomes something that you can do because your state transitions are small enough that it's not a major headache to say that thing needs to change, that part of the event model needs to change you want the confidence to throw away what's there and replace it with something that's supposed to be there. And that old thing might've been in C sharp and the new thing is written in whatever, F sharp or you know, whatever you're doing, uh, whatever the other person is, is skilled in. That's true polyglot, right? Um, for, for fun, there's an example where you can just reroute things on Nginx. Uh, what, you're what you're sharing down below is maybe an event store or set of tables, um, security tokens, reports, you know, you can start to glue all these things together. And then uh, different roles. Uh, so what, what, how does this actually talk to everyone in the company? So UX, UI, obviously designers use the top lane. They love being able to, you know, uh, interact with the tool of their choice, but then things like Miro have plugins for Figma and other things, which is which is kind of nice. So that if you have an event model in Miro and your designers are working in Figma, what they're working on, uh, or, or Adobe, I think Adobe is also, uh, you know, oh, there's plugins that exist for that. So if you're, if your designers are doing that, they're like, hey, cool, we're, we're not just, you know, art, artsy people that don't appreciate the system. The UX, you, the, the user experience uh, aspect of this whole thing is about what information am I seeing? And it's not rocket science, not a bunch of algorithms. It's about can I actually understand that the system remembered what I put in the screen? Can I see where that links up elsewhere? Again, going back to that storyboard uh, approach, does the plot of the movie make sense? Can I see that this conversation in the movie is not confusing someone because what are they talking about? Um, this scene seems like it's you know put in here artificially and there's no continuity. They can they can analyze cognitive load. What is the system remembering for me? What information is available for me to display at any point so that I can present it on the right screen at the right time um, in the workflow that we're supporting? Um, again, we went over quite a lot of the architectural side. Um, the developers, because we're using uh, fine-grained work, um, if you're doing event sourcing, it's event handlers, command handlers, they all become uh, a real good anchor for work. So you can just say, you know, our command handlers and event handlers on average take, you know, um, 
let's say a, a good developer on our team can do two and a half of those a week on average. And we don't, we don't do this on a, on a small set of numbers. So the fact that you're doing a very familiar uh, pattern over and over again, gives you that cadence to then also be able to measure those things. And it's really good also for onboarding because then if someone's coming in and to the team, they can, you know, deploy code that day. Uh, if they're jumping in on a particular vertical slice, you know, they say, well, how do I write a command handler? Well, look at all the previous commits of the entire team for the last week, or just look at the previous command handler that someone else wrote, copy, paste it, change the logic, change the events in it and uh, hook it up to the right screen. You're done. So the, the ability to get onboarded is incredibly easy because you have a, a very good cadence of applying the same strategy to implement the whole solution over and over again. It's not a brand new experiment for every single state transition. It's always something that's done in a certain pattern and, um, and that, that way you get that repeatability. Um, so slices for developers are really, really helpful for uh, many aspects. Um, slices are also good for project management. Again, this goes back to the uh, estimate question and uh, how you can basically show that the system works. As you're completing these, these vertical pieces, um, you can show them actually deployed and working. So they're, again, it's not about this almost done, almost done, 95% done. Um, when, when you have the state transitions done correctly in the, in, in the staging environment, wherever, all the way to production, you can show that these are working. So, and that goes against uh, also that open close principle because if you have reserved all the space for for the proper uh, fields, etc., from the project management side, you know that the coupling has been addressed and that whatever something you know something's being used further down the line, you know that that spot is reserved. So when that ticket is closed you know it's done. Now, interfacing with traditional stuff, uh, Jira systems and all that, these slices make great Jira epics, right? And underneath, you can have a, a Jira ticket for each, you know, unit test or other unit of work or the UI component, et cetera. But on the whole, it's a really nice granule to, uh, to be able to uh, understand what the system is doing. And of course, uh, quality assurance, you're getting a lot of context here. And also for security, which I mentioned, and it's not on the slide, um, for threat modeling, it's, it's gold because a security analyst understands, it, they're not just looking at an API spec, they're actually shown the intention of how the API is going to be used, the sequence of API calls, how the state progresses, instead of trying to reverse engineer all that from just the implementations. So it makes for very effective threat modeling um, for your security side. Um, and also data retention and all these other things are quite uh, uh, quite important. So uh, that's about it. I think we're I'm running late, unfortunately, because it's already 10 after. We're going to have some time for some, some fun exercises and then uh, some uh, homework assignments, but and also some questions and answers. So. Um, we can get uh, through maybe a couple of minutes of, of core questions and answers and then jump into the little exercise and introduce you to kind of where we talk about uh, most of these topics, you know, every week. So uh, for a third uh, meetup that you can join today, <laughs> it's the one that's called uh, Vancouver Event Driven Meetup. Now it's shortened to the Event Driven Meetup because of COVID. There are no borders for these things anymore. <laughs> So uh, we typically do this stuff um, every, every week um, on Fridays, uh, unless I'm super busy, uh, uh, basically trying to get some more people to host it um, in, in the coming weeks, because uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's one, of, uh, it's one of those things that I'm doing quite often. And uh, there's also a podcast that I'm doing that's not on this slide yet. But yeah, the meetup. That where we talk about event modeling quite a lot is the event driven meetup. We also talk about CQRS event sourcing there, um, uh, hexagonal architecture, uh, domain driven design. Uh, we get into discussing some event uh, storming things as well too. And um, it's generally quite uh, a fun thing. So uh, also there is a Slack uh, group that's called the, uh, I guess, eventmodeling.slack.com, but the invite is on the event modeling uh, site on the resources page. You can find the Slack link for the invite. Uh, so any questions that uh, that you have, we generally answer there. 
And, uh, and then of course the YouTube channel uh, is a recording of all of those uh, sessions where we discuss some of these things. And uh, there's another YouTube channel that is the seed of the podcast and that podcast is going to go live as a podcast in the next coming weeks. Um, I'm just going to try and uh, share that with you while I do this one second here. And uh, where do we have that? All right. So there's five episodes on this right now. Screen share. All right, so uh, there we go, share, here we go. So there's five episodes, Vaughn, Vernon, who you all know from Domain Driven Design, CQRS, and Event Storming, etc., was the latest one. Um, Dave Remy from Event Store, lots of, well, yeah, lots of stuff. Bo uh, Bobby Calderwood, the second episode is really good because he's developing a whole tool called Onote that automates code generation from event models and does a whole bunch of other stuff such as project management. Those are all coming up features. So uh, we can see the interview with him there about it. And uh, he has a lot of promo codes. So onote.com is, uh, you might as well mention it because there's a lot of tooling coming out um, around event uh, modeling. And so because there's a set of patterns that are quite nice, you can see that uh, generating them will be generating code from them and having, you know, templates for, let's say I want to add um, login to my system. I can take a template of logging in and I have events that I can link to other parts of my workflow. And so if you remember case tools, this is really what they were missing was the timeline aspect. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's it for that. Any, any questions on the presentation before we jump into some Exercises. Yes, so actually there are quite a few questions already. Maybe I, I just share this um, link. Um, in oh, is it on, on Zoom? So, or? so um, maybe you want to, or I can. I'll, t I'll take care of a few um, of these. Yeah. Um, uh, I just yeah. thought instead of sharing the wall myself, <laughs> I, I share the, the link so that you I can. See, I go, see it. So uh, first question. I will answer the ones that have, I'll answer four. Okay. And then, uh, <laughs> and then from there, we'll go into the exercise and we'll, and then we'll have some time for, uh, uh, for the last one. So uh, resistance you get when you introduce CKRS and event sourcing to organizations. Oh, of course, there's a huge, um, uh, huge, uh, someone just upload uh, up. <laughs> yeah, so at the moment, it's actually the second one. But yeah, now it's the second one. Okay, I just saw it pop up. So I'll answer that. I already talked about it. So the resistance to CKRS is a lot of times um, it's about uh, the talks about CKRS are about the implication to infrastructure. And uh, so needing pub sub or the fact that it's eventually uh, consistent and people have a hard time thinking, well, how am I going to ensure that there's a uh, my you know, my email is unique when I, when I, when I uh, sign up. Um, that's, that's a lot of the traditional resistance. I think it's really a lot about baby duck. Uh, just people are not used to it. Um, I think it's a loss of control for a lot of management because now it's, uh, it's, it's something, you know, they need to study. And um, so adoption of anything really is a disruptive process where if you don't have this done at the top, um, as a as a as a way to to move forward, um, that's kind of a everyone's agreed and, and they're going to do it. Um, it. It ends up having a lot of friction because trying to do things the same way. Let's say you're trying to do a couple of read models that are separate, you know, pub sub style, and the traditional person just starts to reference one from the other, or they skip, you know, the command handler and they say, well, I'm just going to go ahead and. Um, update the read model first. I don't care about the commands you introduced here. This looks like a table in a database. My screen's going to update it. And so, quote unquote, that's, you know, that's next to sabotage, <laughs> not just resistance, but um, you can see all, uh, all aspects of that, of that quote unquote resistance from being absolutely evil to just ignorance or, or, yes. or no, no time. A lot of times, let's not paint everyone as evil. A lot of times it's 
it's the situation and the availability of time to actually do that. That's why, again, event modeling is meant to have that very small, you know, uh, learning curve because then you start to chip away at the resistance. You know, I can I can get the goals of domain driven design, and 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 all those things that we love, done without having to explain domain driven design. You know, at the Christmas party, you can you know whisper it. You Maybe know, even bed for not explaining design. it. <laughs> yeah, you can whisper it at the Christmas party to them. You're doing domain driven design. Shh. <laughs> and we didn't have to get a budget, and we didn't have to disrupt anyone, right? So, so that's uh, that's kind of um, uh, the way that uh, that I see it. So the the big one, event storming refrains from using arrows and labels in order to keep flexible enough to arrange stuff all the time. How do you feel about that? Well. The arrows, honestly, uh, in our diagrams are there for illustration. Uh, as we, um, is there more to that question? I think there's a little scroll bar there. Is that not right? On the, on the, no, on the top one? actually, uh, that, that's all. Oh, that's all, okay. Yep. <laughs> uh, the scroll bar is throwing me off. I think there's more to that question. Anyway, um, so yeah, the arrows honestly are there for uh, when people are learning the, the, um, the concept. And when we're working really fast after many years, um, we really have screens, events, and only a select few commands and read models. We have a shorthand that we develop because we understand the repetitive nature of that. And so now event storming, uh, first of all, we start a lot of event modeling like event storming where we don't have any, any arrows. Where if you look at the seven steps in the main article, it's about putting, it's, it's almost identical to event storming. It's really about the collaborative piece of people throwing ideas up onto the, onto the whiteboard on your orange stickies and saying, hey, these are really you know, cool things that our system should have in it. And then we start to align them on a timeline. Does this make sense as a story? Right? We start to interrogate it and say, yeah, that, that's kind of cool. I can see this as being kind of the workflow or how our system captures things, right? I hope that answers your question, but um, they're not as uh, stringent as you think. And even with a regular event model that's mature, we still move things around left and right. And uh, as the tooling matures, those those arrows should just autofill, right? Um, and they're really about pointing um, for the purpose that I mentioned, uh, information completeness, where you do use the arrows to make sure that you can follow a piece of information and say that you're not making something up. There's an event here and there's a screen across the somewhere else that's using that you need to be able to connect the two that you know you're not sending people down a really nasty path where you know three months down the road they're like whoa we missed a huge part we actually don't have this information that's needed for this workflow piece yes um, yeah there is a related question actually and also mm -hmm. from my experience when using online tools it's really uh, easy to work with arrows and labels and stuff but do you make any difference when you actually do it in a room um, do you then also use arrows or do you know um, we don't we, we, we rarely do um, some sometimes we will if it's if it's really needed to say that we're capturing this but maybe it's only used at the very tail end for like the invoice or something, then I will draw a line to say like, you know, this is the reason that this event has this thing here that we asked for at the very beginning, because a lot of the uh, workflow is kind of, you, you, you're kind of interacting with a system and you're almost always showing the confirmation page or something so that the information is used right away after. So it's kind of nice to just assume that the information is going to be presented in the next few uh, workflow steps. But when there's something that's, out of character, I generally do draw it at that point. Um, you could probably use strings or something else in that format, but yeah. <laughs> cool. Hopefully that answers it. In the meantime, we have another one uh, voted to the top. Oh, yeah. Well, based on your experience, the maximum uh, of events aggregate can hold to perform well. Uh, well, that's entirely, yeah. so Thomas, the, the, the maximum number of events gets into a bigger discussion about um, data management, where we're talking about tombstoning and saying, uh, you know, do we use just uh, infrastructure level type snapshots or do we have a business? And I, I tend to push things toward the business is that if you were doing things on pen and paper, you wouldn't have a filing cabinet the size of your room so that you could have all these events to look at for just online yes. processing. So you would want to have, you know what, we're going to close the books on last month and all the things this month are brand new entities. They might have some yes. initial data with them 
uh, that's fine. We can reference last month if we want, but that those events might actually be stored on slower storage and uh, things like that. You want your online transaction processing to be incredibly quick for really fast blue green deploys. And uh, there's a more important part that's fine for aggregates and, and entities and things like that. The trickier question is for the reports <laughs> that gets into, um, you know, uh, how do you make a snapshot for, for the reporting side? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Adam, what do you think? Um, one last, one, one last, one last question. The, okay. the anonymous one. I think the modeling is one thing, but when it comes to implementation, yeah. how to slice, uh, how to slice this model to reasonable deliverables? Any heuristics? I'll put this into user story. So the user stories are replaced. We don't even use okay. user stories anymore. In fact, um, it the event model is a replacement for user stories because it removes so much of that menial work of trying to type them all up and represent them, et cetera. So again, going back to how the human brain can fill in the blanks, um, we, we get those. If there are a number of permutations of data or uh, you know, some, some, uh, some changes in, in the actual workflow, we do make those, um, we put those on the event model. So, uh, so given when thens we already showed, so they're shown on the event model. Um, Integrating with existing systems, we may need to just type them up real quick because someone already has a system of user story management and we're not going to make them change all of their process in, on day one. So there's a lot of times where we have to put JIRA tickets on top of each slice where we need to put in uh, all the given when thens they just need to be copy pasted into user stories in some JIRA tickets um, and all that. But as, as the team's learn this, they're like, oh, well, why don't I just look at the event model and like, I don't have to click on this and that and the other. I'll go ahead and get 80% of my stuff done. Um, at least I have a reservation for all my data so I don't have to go and crack things open when I'm do doing the next, uh, um, <clears throat> the next uh, stories or, or pieces of work next week or next sprint or whatever. So that would actually be your preferred and recommended approach. And would you then basically directly work with an event model in, on your Miro board or would you do anything else? Well, the, uh, the, the Miro boards are whiteboards, which is, um, I mean, it's good tooling. It gets us to be virtualized, which is really good because we don't want to be taking parchment paper and have stickies dropping on the floor every time we want to look at it. So a digitized version is, is goal one. Goal two is actually to have the digitization be more, um, uh, respectful of the rules within the event model itself. And in so doing, it makes it faster to manipulate uh, that type of document. So that's why I showed Onote because it has those rules built in. And so with those rules built in, it kind of guides you like an IDE. If you want to learn a new language, you can start, you know, open up Notepad and, you know, start typing up arbitrary text. And then the compiler is going to be screaming at you and you're going to be frustrated. But if you have an IDE, right, you're going to have good feedback as you're typing, you're going to be able to hit alt enter and things will autofill for you. You can experiment. That's what tooling does. And so as we progress in anything, really, the tooling starts to mature. We're seeing this already on event sourcing, right? We're starting to see event store has some nice admin pages. Now you people are mm -hmm. used to working like that with Kafka as well. You have all these ways that, that are dealing with streams of data instead of you know some some tables you're going to be querying all the analytics stuff is changing from star schema analytics stuff to like you know stream streaming data instead so the whole world's changing and this is just part of it and as we get out of uh, traditional uh, requirements we're going to have the tooling catch up and say that you know this is actually good enough I see the story like the entire story of the whole business and I can inspect and interrogate different pieces of it and it should expand into those details should I need them to. Okay, cool, Adam. So, um, okay, what? yeah. Let's uh, let me uh, share my screen. Yes, I'm sharing everything, but uh, maybe I have so, to stop first. Uh, no, I think I can. I'm not sure if I can steal focus from you. Uh, I think you'd have to show. I, I don't have a. a so choice. I already stopped. So you should. Oh, okay. Be able to do it now. Where is, um, why can't I see it? <laughs> Do I, I, I don't see my share screen button. Great. Yeah, sometimes it's. Uh... Uh, what's wrong with Zoom? Am I already, I'm not sharing yet, am I? Doesn't look like I am. 
huh. It just uh, totally disappeared from me. I'm doing full size. I don't, uh, my, uh, my share screen I'm button just thinking has disappeared. Because it, yeah, it, it also. <laughs> I was sharing before. What's wrong with happened Zoom? happened to me um, <laughs> once also, a similar situation. But probably it's just uh, this, uh, this bar. Uh, that is somewhere hidden behind one of your windows. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that too. I'm just going to alt tab through anything else that's yes. opened here. And um, there's, uh, there's that. Uh, there's the group chat. So I see the group chat. That window is here too. I'll close that just in case. Or can I help you? When, uh, I don't know. I'm, the, I'm thinking a, I'm going to have to like. Link uh, that, is there a link that I can eventually? Uh, sort of, but it's, it's zoomed in a specific point. So you're going to have to okay. find it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, do, 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 do. Let's see if I can figure this out. Meanwhile, think of other questions. I can answer something while I figure this out. <laughs> There's a, a, a simple one from the chat, Yuri Mobile, um, from the chat, the question, which tool do you use to paint the diagrams? Is it uh, basically Miro or do you also have other tools? Yeah, I showed onote.com already. Um, we're switching to that because it's it has a, a standard uh, for the for the abstract, the abstract syntax tree that com comprises an event model. Um, obviously, there's a structure to it, so uh, we're working on a on a a format for that for elaborating uh, event models. So it's a it's a common format that can be then loaded by an increasing number of tools. So there's two companies that I'm working with right now that are working on the event modeling tooling for all of that. One of them is Onote, and the other one is coming out of Poland shortly forget the name of it is it just mm -hmm. got released like last month. So I'm um, working with both of them to, to make sure that we have um, a standard event model, JSON type of format. Of course it'll evolve, but it's, I'm really into open standards. I know that's a big topic in Europe about not having propri proprietary things and so that you can own your information and things can live on without vendors getting in the way. So it's really important to have that aspect done and, uh, that should be reflected in the tools that you're using. So uh, I generally use Miro because not because it's my favorite, okay. because you know Onode is that, but Miro uh, is something that a lot of companies are familiar with. So they already probably are using Miro for some other uh, some other collaborations, uh, especially during COVID. So um, if I can show an event model used in Miro, then they're like, oh yeah, we already use that. Cool, they can just start. And that. in particular with the with the arrows, they did a really nice job, I think, yeah. so that you can move around and uh, it still it's works weird. out. So this is really cool. Yeah, the anchoring and uh, the fact yes. that you can tie to a yes. specific yeah, edge you can tie or to a the place on an edge end. or yeah. the middle. It's uh, it, yeah, smart routing and all that. That's yeah, that's really nice too, especially when it's an online tool. Um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to uh, leave the meeting and click on it again. So let me back in. Excuse Hopefully that will reset. Good. There was a good uh, suggestion on, this, on the chat. There was a good suggestion on the chat. Okay. If you have, uh, if you have any Zoom window, you can just try Alt S. Oh right, yes. Thank you. Yes, I forgot this. I wasn't was... going to experiment with the with the shortcuts during the live, but someone yeah. already mentioned it. Thank you. That yeah, I that remember. Was, that was, was Mike. Thank you, Mike. Yes, that. thank oh, you. Thank you, much. Mike, and thank thank you, Fabian, for pointing it out. I will now never forget that shortcut. <laughs> 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 so I want you to do a small little exercise and I'll, I'll start doing this um, on screen as well. But if you have people that you're here uh, with and you're on a team or you have friends, uh, get a mural board and fill in the event model for a to-do list. It's a very simple thing. You're going to buy bread, but you start out with an application with nothing on it. Think of the events that have to happen until the point where you, you have bought the bread. Is there one read model in here? Is there two? Um, how many steps do you need uh, to accomplish this little information system for something that may, sits on your phone as an app maybe? But you should be able to start off with, uh, with some events. Uh, you, know, you can think of what they are. Um, here's an, uh, you know, there's sticky notes that you can use. Um, uh, you know, obviously would be add item or add task. Think about your ubiquitous language, add task. One thing that I don't like about sticky notes is that they have a 
a format, right? Uh, that you can only put so many things. So sometimes I, I change it to the rectangle, but uh, for, for now it's good enough to use the stickies. So do this uh, for yourself. Go to Miro.com and you should be able to open that up. Um, also, um, there's Excaladra, which Avon uses, which is quite good. Oops, what is Excaladra on no, here? X. Scala draw is another one. Scala draw, come on. There we go. Uh, yeah, so that was uh, that was a diagram from one of my workshops. So I do workshops as well on this stuff, and we go through different things, similarities between UML, for example, and things like that. So you can see where there's branching in UML and no UI, and uh, other things like that. Uh, but Excaladra is a good one. Um, Miro is a good one. Uh, Excaladra is free, and I think you can share it quite easily. It also has some nice smart routing, but it's different. So if you're familiar with Miro, don't go experimenting with uh, Excaladra right now. You won't have time to kind of adjust to this to the differences. But it's definitely if you're looking for some alternatives, because uh, Miro can get expensive. Um, Excaladra um, is something to experiment with at your company because I know that Miro, when, if you have more than like 10 people in your company, um, they start to look at you funny when you're asking for, you know, a thousand bucks a year for <laughs> Miro to share with everyone. So, so always check, uh, have some alternatives. Uh, we also use Lucidchart in a number of places. But um, yeah, so what would the first thing be here? So I would definitely go with. Uh, Task added. Okay, uh, let's let's actually use things properly in event sourcing. Task added. Your 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 events are in past tense. So task added. Um, add. Uh, so bread. Uh, okay, that's good. But then where does that come in? Actually, I think that we have to make a new screen. So copy the whole thing because that doesn't happen here. Uh, that actually gets typed first. So. The typing happens here, and we can do bread, right? Or buy bread, buy bread. Okay, and then we have to make sure that the information is the same. I always use example data in these things, and that allows people to follow a, a story in a thread. So example data is key, right? And um, if you want to make it complete right away, obviously just uh, copy this and. Um, Make it blue, and it's not task added now. It's an imperative, so it's going to be add task by bread. And um, you can be quite, you know, deliberate by joining the arrows if you want. I, I suggest you start with doing arrows because it's it's more fun to follow the flow. And again, you're moving left to right, so no arrows should point backwards. If you want to use an event again. Or make a use a new form of a of a read model. Copy it, change it. The 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 uh, the timeline moves only forward. You should always be able to do to do that. So um, so that's great. So after we we're, we're done that, obviously there's some sort of a model that we're updating here. So maybe uh, let's take the position of having two separate read models uh, for one side and the other. Sometimes you might want to just do it in one. But here we would have a, uh, what's it called? Uh, I guess it would be done items or to do, to do, to do list. Be a list of things that we need to do. And of course, it's a projection of our events that have happened. So that might be a table that has these things stored in it. And after that, our next our next screen we just duplicate that see how easy it is obviously this gets blanked out and then here we can start oh boy why is that so large let's get that to be a little bit smaller okay and then so buy bread suddenly appears here and i think it's still a little oops a little big. There we go. I think that's the right size. Buy bread. <clears throat> uh, and of course, this is if you want to be uh, very um, explicit about what's going on, you can also say that, hey, since I have a, a, a read model here, or maybe a table in a database somewhere, 
I also want to show that this by default shows nothing, right? I can say that this actually is drawing at the beginning, the default is nothing. And so we can delete that. So our to do, uh, maybe I'll just do that. Yeah, to do list is empty. Ah, see, that's the problem. I don't, that's why I, a lot of times don't use the sticky notes and use the rectangles because the sticky notes have a bunch of helpers that sometimes don't help <laughs> and they'll zoom in and, and uh, get rid of your white space and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah. So you can see that it's empty here, but as soon as we click this button, add new, um, it uh, it captures our state. And then we have one of these things here. Um, then of course, what happens when we drag and drop the buy bread to done? That means we probably wanna finish it, right? So, oops, I forgot to, I forgot to link this up here. So now this is showing that. Um, I can, if I'm going to be explicit, this is why I don't use arrows everywhere, by the way. Um, obviously, if you want to be very, very thorough, you can show that this is also being used here. It didn't really change. I, need, I don't need to make another instance of it, but that is optional. So as you get more familiar with it, you'll be dropping a lot of the use of the arrows, right? Um, you, won't, you won't bother um, with that. Now, if you're working with someone else, it's really nice to see if someone can work backwards while you work forward and that you're going to meet by convention the same types of events you're going to rely on. Um, so that's anyone having issues with Miro or anything else that I can help with in terms of uh, these very simple components, right? Um, you, you have to see how quickly you can get going with this. Um, without having a lot of software to install and uh, and just just get going very quickly saying uh, what what the system is going to be doing and use example data, use some mockups. Sometimes we take screenshots of the existing application and superimpose the changes on those screens uh, within Miro to uh, to basically do that. So, I'll give you another five minutes to to play with that, maybe another minute, and then I'm going to assign um, assign a change that's going to make this from very trivial to not very trivial by adding one piece of information. Can I ask you a question in the meantime? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I was just wondering about the level of details because you added, for example, for the to-do list that it should be empty at the beginning, but we also have the input field and the That's down right. field. So should we add those as well? And well, the 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 add the actual add field the the text box doesn't really get any information from the back end. If you think of a traditional web application, right? It would unless you wanted a default value there or something, you really wouldn't go back to the system, right? On the other side. So I generally are, I'm not very, even this is too much, like for what I do. If I don't have an empty to-do list, I understand that by convention, our read models are empty. And uh, so there's a lot of things that'll just, you'll learn that, oh yeah, that doesn't make sense to always specify an empty collection every time I have these type of collection read models. So I can really move things to, to, to these implicit ways of specifying, which allows you to gain more speed. And that's kind of the secret sauce of, of event modeling is that it allows you to you know, be explicit for the important things like state, but be very implicit for other things so that you get going on getting a specification faster and also not belabor it by extra things. So you know, if I was doing this, you know, I, I you know, wouldn't even bother with this one. May I might actually just to just to have a placeholder for it. And of course, the done is going to be another placeholder. So if I have a screen that's sitting for the first time, uh, depending on the team I'm working with, I, I might um, duplicate this and um, and just call it done list. And then link that up just to show that on the back end there are two tables that are going to be used to you know make sure that this works 
And then I show all the other interactions, but it sets the stage nicely. Sometimes I do this. Uh, most of the time I understand, uh, especially if it's important, because sometimes it might be uh, tasks and then you just have a column called done or not done, right? And then you're just filtering um, on what you sh show on each side, or it might just be manipulation on the UI itself, where it takes that whole collection and, and moves items to one side or the other. Um, but that's really implementation heavy. I think I really want to um, just show state. And so if I do have two lists being managed, I want to show that. If I have one list being managed, I want to show that because that's something that we can uh, work off of better. So uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's that. So let's finish this for now. And for, for the homework, um, we're going to look at uh, the event modeling site because there is the four patterns that I skimmed over because we didn't have much time. So if we go to, um, yeah, where is it here? The original article. And uh, we go to, oh, where is it here? Automation, right? So we have automation and translation. Basically external systems inputting something. So this is GPS coordinates being transformed into something more meaningful, like uh, the guest left the hotel room based on their GPS location. So that's an interesting pattern. And another pattern is automation, when we need to affect external systems by um, having some sort of a batch job, kick off something and bring back information after that. So sending email, payment processing, there's a standard pattern for that, right? It's called automation and it generally follows this pattern here. And you can notice that I have highlighted the four patterns as I go through them in, in all of these and how you specify them. So you can always reference this here for those four patterns. But we're going to make use of, um, of the third pattern for our homework assignment. And that's going to be, so this, everyone can see where, the, where this ends up, right? I think this is not very complex. But if I say that my system somehow Oops, let me just uh, type in some data here with, where's my, where is my text? There it is, okay. So I will do total and you can use euros if you want, but I will use North American dollars, $10 and 56 cents. How in the world will this work? Here are things that I will set you off for your homework. Now, assume that you have a spy-like device in your hand that most people have these days that spy on where you are, what you're searching for, what you're Googling. So imagine you're actually using this list to go do your shopping. The application will know your physical location in the world. It'll also have a way to understand that Google Maps knows which stores are in certain locations. I will also realize that the stores that I'm going to have an online presence where they list the prices of their products. And I also know that I have fuzzy matching on the product description versus what I have in my to-do list. So how many systems are gonna be at play? So that the, this very simple to-do list just got exponentially more difficult when I added this with the interaction of at least one large external systems uh, system and maybe another subsystem that we need to do. So your homework is to finish this with swim lanes and automation. You can find in, in Miro the, the actual uh, gear by just going to the icon finder. I like this thing a lot. You can just type in gears. If I hit enter, I have some gears. And so anytime you have a background process, you might have something like this over here. As soon as it, that, there you go. So you can, um, you can have some automation there. For example, here's another thing that I do. A lot of times I have the top, uh, let's say the top swim lane as actual physical stuff. So sometimes the swim lanes are arranged in a way that shows more technical things to the bottom and things that are more human 
and right next to you, sort of like a Wardley map where you have things that are interacting with the user needs right at the top versus some very, very technical things at the very bottom. And sometimes I, I do that arrangement for it. But here, let's put a human-like event, entered store. Entered store. And here, paid at till. These are physical things that we're actually doing. Paid at till. So at the cashier, I guess you use that word more in Europe. What do you think I'm doing with the app as I'm doing these things? I'm probably reading what's on the screen when I'm at the store. Um, probably once the, as the cashier is bagging things, I probably have the app saying, yeah, I picked up these things and I have to go to another store, right? Maybe I buy bread at the bakery and maybe I buy milk somewhere else. But think about these real events that are happening on this timeline and what you're doing here. And how do I get this total? See how, um, how you can use event modeling to explain to business and technical people what has to happen on that app. And especially for people that are non-technical, if there's anyone that's non-technical here, um, this is your chance to shine by showing your understanding of a system well enough to be used as requirements that can then be averaged out for velocities and actually be productive. So I'm going to leave um, you with this puzzle uh, because it, it explodes a very simple system into quite a complex system where you have to use some of the patterns in the event modeling advanced side. And uh, if anyone is curious, our meetup is tomorrow. Um, it starts about an hour after this one started. So 7 p.m. your time, if this was 6 p.m. Uh, your time. Uh, it's a 10, well, maybe, sorry, not 7, 7.30, because we start at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time in North America. And I did that on purpose so that we can have all of North America and Europe um, participate. So what are you going to call this processor? What is it going to need to do its thing to fetch data from those other services? There's a GPS component, which I already kind of showed a little bit in the article about the hotel system, but you have a few more things. So if you're, if, if you're curious how this goes, this is a really good little piece of homework to, to do. So I have five minutes left and I'm happy to answer the remaining questions and anything else, or if people cool. want to chat. Um, Adam, <laughs> I just wanted to ask whether there is a possibility for people to check uh, back with you, but then tomorrow in the meetup tomorrow, you would uh, mm -hmm. dig a little bit more into this. Yes. Would you? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, it's a hook. It's like a you know the Fair two episode series on a TV show. <laughs> yeah. The car is about to go off the cliff. What happens next? Tune in yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> cool. So if we really have uh, five uh, minutes left, six minutes left, then maybe um, I uh, let's go back to the questions quickly. Sure. You can um, you can share screen. Yeah. I can stop sharing mine. And uh, so people can see the questions again, and you also can see them. Oh, so we have to... yeah. Can one command trigger multiple events for one aggregate of so how do you ensure the order of publishing an in synchronous event bus? Oh, okay. So Thomas, that is a very technical question. And so the, the, uh, the point of event modeling is to show the state as you imagine it to happen. So we rarely go in and say that we need to um, we need to show that now. Sometimes, um, if I have an order that's that's required, I may show a read model evolving, listening for those things, and throw an error if it actually is uh, backwards. But I'm always working on what is the state in those two scenarios, and I only focus on the state. So, you know commands triggering multiple events, the word aggregate, uh, publishing, asynchronous, those tend to be very technical. And what we need to do is to show by example of state progressing through time, those concepts to non-technical people. And if we do that, 
we should implicitly, as technical people implementing it, reach for things that are asynchronous or reach for pub sub and maybe abstract some of our solution as aggregates. Um, in terms of triggering, you know, a command triggering multiple events, does that mean that the success of the command stores two separate events? Um, is, is that the best solution? Do, do we have a single event that then another system listens to and decomposes into separate, two separate events? Those are all at your disposal, but the focus is always state by example, not how am I gonna implement this? That is entirely up to you. Um, and the reason that that's done is so that we're moving away from technically centric specifications to specifications that are usable by everyone. Um, but certainly when we need to elaborate some of these things, I use the very bottom uh, swim lanes for some of those technical things. Like in one case, eventual consistency with event store um, and or actually concurrency, not eventual consistency, but, but concurrency when someone was trying to do the same thing at the same time, maybe they're buying tickets for an online concert or something um, or buying tickets for a concert online. Um, the business might need to know how concurrency is handled by a tool. And there I showed, you know, we can go into this tomorrow, um, how you would explain how event store works, for example, uh, to your to the business by in examples they understand. But the sequence of how that decision, when two people press the button at the same time to buy the concert ticket and, and there's limited amount, what does the system how does the system handle that? Those are the, those are the crossover pieces that we sometimes use. Um, but certainly, yes, one command can trigger multiple events, uh, and the order um, so the order of uh, of, of publishing those uh, on an event bus is really just by example. So if I have you know a, a command triggering um, depleted inventory and um, uh, scheduled delivery or something. Um, a, I would probably, in, in such an example, I would probably break that out into a workflow where I wouldn't have one command do that. I would have that broken out into steps. And I think that happens quite a lot when we want to have one command trigger two things. I want to have one thing called initial, initiating some longer running workflow and then start to really decompose what we would have in a saga or, or a process manager into, into steps that are maybe handled by one or more process managers and move some projection of the state of that saga or whatever in, in a to-do list as we express it. Uh, but this is the kind of stuff that we use as examples every Friday in the, in the meetup. Um, and it, it's, an, it's, a, it's a topic that comes up quite often as people are playing with pub sub, um, you know, event stores, eventual consistency, uh, matters and we try to explain it generally with event modeling as the way to note that uh, but also we we try to take the perspective back and make sure that it's always accessible to people that are not um, experts or need to know and or understand uh, event buses or anything else like that so slide 22 are you suggesting to use only one event store um Nope, <laughs> we actually use uh, multiple event stores for services, different services. We do sometimes short circuit uh, not having a, an event bus by subscribing directly to other event stores. Now, depending on the security you know, risks and all those other things, that's what we may do. Um, I try to not use more than more event stores if I don't need to. Uh, I know that I can move streams to new event stores quite easily if I ever need to dissect and, and organize a solution better for, uh, for scalability later. So um, you're, that's more of an event uh, sourcing question, uh, but generally, yeah, we can, uh, with, with, with a proper traceability of what happened, that's the big, biggest point of event sourcing is that you can always migrate to a new implementation and new types of events if you run into problems. You know, the fact that we were storing things a certain way and organizing them in one event store is just the fact of the matter that that's how the solution went. There's no nothing holding you back from migrating that to a solution that has 
two services with two event stores. Or if you're talking about scalability, instead of one event store using a cluster of three for you know performance or whatever. So I hope that answers that. Yeah, uh, actually, Ledger. It's eight o'clock, but maybe a very last one, yes, because it's, yeah, it's sure, really yeah. interesting one. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to stay for as long as possible. I just want to be respectful of people's time as it's it's late in Europe. So I'm happy to stay, but uh... that's that's not a dangerous <laughs> thing to say. That I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, within reason, uh, you know, uh, half hour. I would, suggest, I would suggest let's take <laughs> this as a very last one. Uh, sure. The ledgers and blockchain question, and uh, I don't know whether you have. Yeah, I mean, so blockchains. A, I think it's. I think GDPR is really important. I think le these ledgers and um, and blockchain. Um, is really a good topic we didn't touch on. And I'm saying it's really important because the hype of blockchain has really uh, made everyone aware that you can store state like this effectively, that it's not some database table. Entire systems that are pushed into every nook and cranny of, of different domains blockchain for everything, right? Everyone's in love with it. So you can use it to make sure that your milk arrived on time and that the milk the delivery person was accountable. Um, th these are the types of decentralized, all these really good things that you hear about and, and, and uh, you know, excellent things that come with blockchain. It is that ledger thinking. And so that also, you know, besides blockchain also goes into AI. If you have a stream of truth that you can rely on, then your AI stuff can work better because you have more faith in the, you know, the stuff that, uh, that the AI engine is, is consuming. So there's a lot of really good trends that are complementary to what we're doing in these reactive systems, as we've been trying to do with domain driven design and other things, they're all helping us quite a lot. And uh, this is the time where it's really nice to go to companies that are experimenting with blockchain and say, well, why don't you just use that blockchain approach for all your systems that you have on hand, all the other menial stuff as well. You will benefit in these ways. So I think it's really, I think it's really good. Um, and applying this for blockchain is quite easy. I mean, you, you may want to, a blockchain slow, of course, because it has a consensus, but pegging some, some you know, uh, checkpoints once a week or whatever, so that your ledger of your actual, you know, small, tiny transactions at your company that are very frequent are, you know, the hash is committed to some, some blockchain that, that is immutable. So you can guarantee that for your customers and all that. Um, and an event model can express what's on the blockchain just the same. It's really just a a timeline of, of adding more things to the ledger. So why not? Absolutely. It's um, so I, in terms of special experience, we have one company that's doing uh, a decentralized application in the form of a blockchain ledger, but it's more about not a global ledger, but a, a trusted network of connections that ebbs and flows for, for that. So we, we are using uh, event modeling to, uh, to describe that system. So uh, I, yeah, that's been a project for the last two years with our company, and uh, there's no problem. It's, it goes like hand in glove, very, very applicable. Yeah. And uh, oh. GDPR, what if you have to, you know, the last part of that is that you have an immutable ledger. How do you get rid of information? I just tweeted about that uh, recently. Um, you have to be very careful because uh, you need to start introducing salt uh, values because even if you delete some entry somewhere, uh, if you have hashes ensuring anything that's the integrity, even in a, in a, in a cache situation, um, you can very quickly reverse engineer a previous email address or any number of information. So, so things like when you have a password in your system, why do you have a salt value? Because you, it's supposed to be very, very hard to reverse engineer a password. You mm -hmm. can't use rainbow tables and all those things. Same thing goes for GDPR and very few people realize that. And I was just thinking, you know, we're not even, we're not even paying the proper attention to the right to be forgotten in GDPR in the industry. We're only scratching the surface. There's a whole bunch of stuff that has to go on the application layer in terms of our domains and all that, but also on the caching, the transmission, event buses, all that kind of stuff. If you don't have the same due diligence to how you treat a password on private information, you haven't done the work. And what we have in password changes and all those things and 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 uh, and treating encryption properly, we, we rarely have that in, in GDPR uh, stuff. It's like, oh, just forget the key, is that's enough. 
like eh, what about some caches that you know lived with some of that information or just you know mask out that email well yeah. you already have some hash that 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 has a, that has a clue as to what that was so you have to be very careful um, but uh, yeah gdpr um, generally a uh, question there is forget keys but i think uh, other aspects of uh, of security have to be introduced that haven't made it there yet um, but like any data you can treat it the same way so um, you can offload the actual payloads and your event store can just be pointers to the information to a traditional database where you can delete that. Um, event store is one thing that we use where you can actually delete the streams, which is fine too. Uh, so yeah, GDPR is, uh, this doesn't really change much um, in terms of uh, GDPR. In fact, in an event model, you can show a timeline where, you know, three months has passed or a month has passed and someone has unsubscribed. Um, to your service that their information is now, this is an automation process that now cleans these read models and uh, deletes these streams. Cool, Adam. Um, I would uh, I would actually suggest it's uh, now uh, eight, uh, sure. eight, it's eight o'clock <laughs> with us. And um, so I, I would suggest let's call it a day sure. for us and uh, let's open the possibility for, for a, a day for you because uh, <laughs> no problem, with you yeah. it's uh, now 11 a.m. I guess, and yep. uh, so 11 a.m. here also can get your day started. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Um, no, thank you. Really I really cool. enjoyed this. Really, really uh, cool to, to have you. Uh, you also pointed to your, um, and you do that to your meetup, which you really do mm -hmm. on a weekly basis, I understood. Yeah, uh, if possible. I mean, sometimes work gets in the way, and uh, and I, I have to cancel. But I try to uh, I try to always uh, uh, do that. So again, the um, uh, the meetup is called the Event Driven Meetup. I can share my screen quickly just mm -hmm. to pop it up because I don't. Oops. I just I'll launch another application. <laughs> Click that, click that, and uh, that is done. And Alt S. It's also already shared in the chat. Oh, okay. Well, there you already should see something like that. So that's that. Yeah, the there's an event modeling going on in Lyon, France, yes. from a couple of years ago, and. Uh, you can see some of the past ones that we have here. Um, and uh, yeah, tomorrow, um, 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, that would be, um, I guess, uh, 7.30 <laughs> Vienna Standard Time. <laughs> yes, should be 7.30, yes. Yeah. Um, so um, if you want to good. have your homework checked for you, uh, come by tomorrow. And uh, I'm curious to see how you model uh, getting that information for our um for big change here this uh, adding this little um I have this little price piece is a interesting problem cool thank you very much adam um so then let me maybe also just point to our next uh, meetups which we will have in in vienna so mm -hmm. if you um uh, check out our meetup pages then um, we will um, on uh, 25th of March, uh, we will have a DDD uh, meetup with uh, Matthias Ostermeyer about uh, fractale architecturen. So it will be a, a German um, speaking meetup. And then on 7th of April in Re uh, Reactive Vienna, we have um, Andreas Melcher with um, the micro front and uh, plug in system. Um, he and uh, his company built for the Austrian uh, judicial system. So that's uh, also an in interesting upcoming topic. Yes, so um, uh, that was uh, um, our meetup with uh, Adam Dimitruk um, and uh, event modeling. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it just as much as I did. Um, and I'm really uh, inclined to join uh, Uh, your meetup tomorrow to learn about to learn more about uh, what we what we uh, just uh, started today. But yeah, I, I I hope to see some people there. We can get yeah. into the nitty gritty of a lot of. The no, stuff it's uh, really cool that for. you actually do it at the time, so that it's also possible to join from from Europe. Yeah. 
Well, it depends on your Friday uh, plans. I don't, after COVID, I don't think it'll be as popular in Europe. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh... once you can go back out to the you know restaurants again and clubs and all that. Uh, that's yeah, it's the kind worst of time. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> but then uh, we actually uh, had as a, a kind of standard meetup time for our for our DDD design before COVID. We actually had Friday 4 p.m. and it turned out to be a, a good choice. Oh, yeah. uh, yes, yeah. Friday seven thirty. You really have to be convinced <laughs> that you really that you're really you have to be committed. Yes, to you have learning. to be committed. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I always treat. So you people, will get the committed uh, guys. If I see someone from Europe on a Friday, I, <laughs> I know that I have to answer all their questions. That's for sure. <laughs> cool. So <laughs> thank you, thank Martin. you, Adam. So good to see you again. And uh, you know, I hope uh, after COVID. I'll, I'll be in Europe. And, I uh, also hope there will be another possibility. Um, I don't know whether you remember, because actually we met, uh, you mentioned uh, Bologna, and actually we met there the first that's time. Right. I know, yes. I do, I do, I know, and, I remember. Uh, <laughs> I really hope that there will be other possibilities, um, and yes. Um, Absolutely, likewise. There will be I, some I can't time wait. after we're, COVID. It we're getting our vaccine, so I'm yeah. looking forward to this. <laughs> okay. Okay, Thank have you, a wonderful Adam. evening. Bye bye. And uh, we'll um, see you next time. See you. And bye. Uh, thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>